Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions, and the portfolio questions today is uh, social justice, housing and local government. Uh, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function. And again, I would make a plea uh, in order to get as many members in as possible for succinct questions and answers to match. Question number one, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. We heard the FMQs earlier this afternoon about a report by Glasgow University and the Glasgow Centre for Population that due to Tory austerity, 20,000 more deaths in Scotland than expected were recorded in an eight-year period. Can I ask the Scottish Government what recent engagement it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact of the cost of living crisis on poverty levels in Scotland so we can avoid similar excess deaths in the future? Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Robertson. Well, I, I certainly share the, the member's concern, as expressed by the, the First Minister, about that shocking report. Uh, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have made uh, repeated calls for immediate action to support households. Following the, the UK uh, mini-budget, the Deputy First Minister has again written to the Chancellor seeking a reversal of the damage inflicted on people who are already bearing the brunt and having to choose between going hungry or cold. And We will continue to use the limited powers and finite budget available to mitigate the impact of actions which undermine our efforts to tackle poverty and to press the UK Government for targeted support for householders and businesses, increases to Social Security and for greater financial powers and resources, because that uh, report that uh, Paul McClellan referred to it was obviously looking back to the previous austerity, and it is very frightening indeed that we could see that repeated again and more so uh, with uh, a new era of austerity, which of course we want to avoid. Paul McLennan. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? There is no doubt that UK Government policies are adding huge pressure on those already struggling to stay afloat. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my frustrations that while the Scottish Government is doing all it can to help people, the reality is there is a limit to what can be achieved without the full fiscal powers and borrowing powers that the UK Government has? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do share this, uh, that frustration. And, and whilst the decisions of the UK Government co to continue to push people into hardship, we have allocated almost three, £3 billion pounds this year from our fixed budget, which is um, a budget that is worth £1.7 billion less than it was in December due to inflation. And the harsh reality of a fixed budget means that every pound that we spend to help with rising costs will have to be funded by reductions elsewhere. And that's why it's vital this Parliament should have the full powers to be able to tackle poverty and the cost of living and support those in need. Question number two, Paul O'Kane. Ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to provide additional financial resources for the third sector organisations that are on the front line in providing advice and support services as the cost of living crisis continues to deepen. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the third sector is hugely uh, diverse, often providing lifeline services to our most vulnerable communities. That is why we have invested around £12.5 million to support the provision of free income maximisation and welfare and debt advice this year. And whilst we do all we can, our largely fixed budgets and limited fiscal powers mean we need the UK Government to take urgent action to support those in need. We continue to deliver on key commitments to the third sector around fairer funding by providing uh, multi-year funding where we can uh, to provide much-needed stability in these uncertain times. Paul O'Kane. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In the summer, I met with a wide range of third sector organisations across West Scotland, including the Lochwinnock Community Pantry and Starter Packs in Verclyde. Uh, new research from SCVO has revealed the precarious situation third sector organisations are facing, with figures showing that 64 per cent of third sector organisations have reported an increase in demand, and 61 per cent have described facing imminent financial challenges. Many, indeed, are worried about how they will keep the lights on and the doors open. So, Will the Cabinet Secretary uh, commit to establishing a new third sector resilience fund, as was the case at the start of the pandemic, to ensure that third sector organisations can continue to support the most vulnerable, rather than being focused on their own survival? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Paul O'Kane raises some important points, and uh, he's quite right to highlight the work of important frontline organisations that are really helping people during the, the cost of living crisis. Uh, SCVO um, have estimated that the public sector as a whole invests around £1.8 billion each year to support the work of charities and social enterprises, and of that, around £500 million comes from the Scottish Government. Uh, through a, a broad range of programmes, uh, including uh, supporting uh, me mental wellbeing, community empowerment, children, families, health and social care. 
Um, we are talking to the sector about how we move more to multi-year funding because we know that stability is important, not least to be able to retain and recruit staff. So we will continue to have those discussions. And as we take forward discussions through the emergency budget review and the budget beyond that, of course, we will give consideration to the, to the points that uh, the member raises. Supplementary, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, in the debate on Tuesday night, you said that your officers and yourself meet regularly with SCVO to talk about different issues. Will you commit now for yourself to meet with SCVO to talk about three-year funding packages? Will you commit to a meeting with them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've just said to, to Paul O'Kane in my answer to, to him, uh, we will continue to meet with SCVO and others uh, to talk about multi-year funding, uh, that's what we're doing already, and um, we'll continue to have uh, those, those meetings. But you know, the, the point I need to make to Jeremy Balfour is this, um, that if we see continued reductions to our budgets, either through inflation and the £1.7 billion uh, pounds reduction in value of existing budgets, plus the potential £18 billion pounds worth of cuts to public services that uh, could come at us from the UK government decisions, then that puts at risk funding across the board, including the support that we give to the third sector. So I would uh, urge Jeremy Balfour to be having the same discussions with his UK counterparts about the importance of maintaining Scottish budgets for those, for those very reasons. And supplementary, Elena Whitton. As a former third sector worker, I recognise just how much organisations across Scotland support our communities, and it is abundantly clear that additional funding is required from the UK Government to meet the demands of this current cost crisis, especially as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined the £1.7 billion um, reduction in our budget due to inflation. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what engagement the Scottish Government has had with other devolved administrations regarding this specific issue? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so the Deputy First Minister spoke with the Finance Ministers from Wales and Northern Ireland last month, who of course are facing similar pressures. The Deputy First Minister and his counterparts wrote to the Chancellor last week to request an urgent meeting and called for additional funding uh, to deal with this crisis. Um, it's really important that uh, that meeting takes place uh, because I think it's not just the Scottish Government that's voicing these concerns. The same concerns are being voiced uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the Welsh Government and from the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. Question number three, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is regarding the impact on Scotland of the UK Government's reported plans to withdraw the Bill of Rights Bill. Minister Christina McKelvey. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. It was very welcome to hear the UK Government had postponed their dangerous, ill-conceived Bill of Rights Bill, which was an unwelcome attempt to deprive us all of the rights and freedoms that are the foundations of a modern democratic society. It would also have undermined the Scottish Parliament and the devolution settlement. It was therefore I was therefore concerned by comments at the weekend from the UK Justice Secretary, who said he remained committed to reforming the Human Rights Act. I would instead urge the UK Government to reverse their plans and instead focus on making rights real for everyone across the whole of the UK. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. Um, I wonder if she can outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure the protection of EU, international and domestic human rights law in Scotland as this right-wing UK Government, whether it is through the Bill of Rights or just their general approach to inequalities in the UK, continue to threaten them. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. In contrast to the regressive Minister. approach of the UK Government, our priority is to strengthen the domestic legal protection and practical application of international human rights standards. We have already committed to introducing a new landmark human rights bill during the current Parliament. And we also remain committed to incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as far as possible within devolved competence and to aligning with e European law in devolved areas where that is possible and appropriate. And I continue to urge the UK Government to reaffirm their commitment to the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act. Question number four, Ariane Burgess. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Was that... It's your question number four, Thank you. Ariane Burgess. To ask the Scottish Government how it will overcome reported significant skills and supply chain shortages in the Highlands and Islands to deliver 11,000 rural and island homes by 2032. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is aware of the global issues affecting construction which are impacting on affordable housing delivery. 
We are working closely with the construction industry and housing partners to mitigate this where possible, and we operate a flexible grant system that can take account of increased costs. More than 6,000 affordable homes were delivered in rural and island communities over the previous Parliament, and we have started towards our next target. We are aware of the barriers uh, in these, though, and that is why we are developing a remote rural and islands housing action plan to help deal with that. Ariane Burgess. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. While the challenge of the housing crisis in the Highlands and Islands is significant, so are the opportunities for job creation and investment. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to tell me what work has been done to estimate the required jobs and skills training programmes uh, needed in the Highlands and Islands to tackle this crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, with partners, um, we have identified very much the opportunities that Ariane uh, Burgess refers to around job creation and investment. We know that there is a skills shortage, particularly in the construction industry. And so Skills Development Scotland and other partners, it is really important that we are encouraging, for example, young people uh, into those um, trades and careers. Um, and we need to, to, that also has the benefit, of course, of keeping young people living in rural communities. So it's not just about providing housing, although affordable housing is key, it is also about the jobs and other opportunities that go with that. I am very happy to keep Ariane Burgess uh, um, updated uh, about the progress being made. And supplementary, Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much. Um, as well as skills shortages, and another issue that is affecting the delivery of new housing in the islands is the unwillingness of energy supply companies to actually install meters in new build uh, properties. I wonder whether the Cabinet Secretary uh, might be uh, minded to liaise with our Cabinet Secretary uh, colleague Michael Matheson in making representations to, to Ofgem about how, you, uh, how this uh, market failure might be addressed, not least perhaps by lifting the ban on uh, distribution network uh, operators fitting metres while they uh, install the supply in new properties in island communities. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Liam Cather raises an important point, and of course it is not just an issue that affects uh, Orkney and the islands, it is actually an issue that has affected other uh, new builds and being able to actually get them uh, ready for occupation. That is very frustrating. So I am happy to speak to uh, colleagues and to, to come back to him, but of course it is important that we do raise these matters uh, um, as, as frequently as often as, as we can to try and um, get um, uh, progress made in order that it does not hold up particularly affordable housing supply. And supplementary, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you. Some of the several severe unintended consequences of the uh, SNP's rent freeze proposals, in the words of the Federation of Housing Associations, has a negative impact on the development of new homes, improvements to existing stock, and pursuit of net zero targets, and a reduced development of rented homes in both the social and private sectors will inevitably reduce availability where supply is already stretched. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary directly what analysis the Scottish Government has done on the impacts of the legislation going through at the moment on housing availability in rural and island areas? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first of all say to the member that we have a, a good track record of delivering uh, affordable housing, whether that's in urban Scotland or in rural and islands, Communities. The latest figures out on Tuesday show that we have delivered uh, nearly 113,000 affordable homes since 2007, over 79,000 of which were for social rent. That is 62 per cent more affordable homes being delivered per head of population than in England. So the context to our affordable housing supply programme is important. We have debated over uh, the last two days the detail of the measures we are taking, the emergency measures we are taking, in order to support tenants and avoid them losing their homes and not being able to afford uh, their rents. We have spoken to the SFHA in detail about working in partnership around an agreement that can be put in place that makes sure that the investment in social housing, whether it is in rural Scotland or in urban Scotland, continues uh, to be made. But I would make this point that is being made not just by the SFH, SFHA, but by the Scottish Association of Landlords. The key problem for landlords at the moment are interest rates that are putting their costs up. Perhaps the member should pay more attention to that. And finally, it is well seen what side 
the Tory party is on when it comes to supporting tenants, and perhaps that's why they are where they are in the polls that have been published this week. Question number five, Colin Beattie, who is joining us remotely. Mr Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how the needs of mobile home residents will be incorporated into the final New Deal for tenants. Cabinet Secretary. The consultation on our New Deal sought views on how we can improve accessibility standards and affordability choices across the whole rented sector. The focus of the question on mobile homes uh, were uh, issues for people who have a standard tenancy on a mobile home owned by a landlord. It also committed us to a post-implementation review of the mobile home site licensing scheme. We are now considering our responses to the consultation about issues for renters of mobile homes to identify potential gaps in protections which will inform our housing bill. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The draft New Deal for Tenants underlined that the Scottish Government intends to carry out a post-implementation review of the Residential Mobile Homes Sites Licensing Scheme before the end of this Parliament. And while this is welcome news to constituents who live in mobile and park homes, many of them worry that issues around enforcement of the licensing scheme are not being addressed quickly enough. Can I ask for the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that the needs of mobile home residents will be considered with the same urgency as those living in other types of residence? Cabinet Secretary. So I, I'm committed to ensuring that people living permanently in mobile homes have appropriate protections. The new site licensing system for residential mobile home sites was introduced in May 2017 and came fully into force in May 2019. It provides local authorities with a range of powers to help them issue, manage and revoke site licences to ensure sites meet modern standards, including the behaviour of site owners. And while the review will seek improvements for the licensing framework, local authorities remain responsible for enforcing licensing conditions in the meantime. We are ha happy to keep the member updated of progress. A supplementary, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Pitch, fee pitch fees for my Cunningham South constituents who live on mobile sites rise by a maximum of RPI annually. The gap between RPI and CPI is increasing, with pitch, free, pitch fees growing faster than pension incomes. Can I ask the Scottish Government to look at addressing this by moving up rating to CPI? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so mobile, mobile home pitch fee increases are regulated under the, the Mobile Homes Act 1983, and under the Act there is a presumption that pitch fees rise by a maximum of the uh, RPI annually, and we've heard concerns that the gap, as the member is just uh, saying, that the gap between RPI and CPI is growing, with the result that pitch fees are growing faster than pension income. So we will therefore undertake the required uh, consultation on moving the basis of uprating from RPI to CPI in time for the forthcoming housing bill, and this would slow the rate of pitch fee increases in the future. I'm happy again to keep the member updated. Question number six, Emma Harper. Scottish Government what action it has taken to tackle rural isolation and loneliness, particularly in the approach to the winter period. Minister. President Officer, we recognise that challenges relating to isolation may be increasing in rural communities due to the pandemic and cost crisis. We support the National Rural Mental Health Forum, which helps people maintain good mental, well, mental health wellbeing by developing connections between rural communities. Our Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund has provided £36 million to community to groups tackling isolation, loneliness and mental health inequalities, including 468 projects supporting people disadvantaged by geographical location. Our forthcoming Social Isolation and Loneliness Plan will outline a range of actions across the Scottish Government which impact positively on social isolation and loneliness. Emma Harper. <clears throat> I thank the Minister for that response. The Tory-made cost, cost of living crisis will do nothing other than exacerbate social isolation and loneliness, particularly for those living in rural areas like Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders. People are being forced to make a choice between eating and heating, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation stated that 19 per cent of people in Scotland currently state they cannot afford social outings. Can the Minister outline any further action the Scottish Government is taking to support people's wellbeing this winter? And does she agree with me that ultimately Scotland must have independence to be free from constantly mitigating the harms created by the UK Government? Minister. Presiding officer, we are taking action within our devolved powers and fixed budget, which will help those facing the combined effects of higher energy bills, rising inflation and the impact of the UK Government's policies. Mm -hmm. 
Just last week, we launched a new cost of living website so that people can find out about the help and support available to them. The Scottish Government has continually urged the UK Government to focus its efforts on those most impacted, but they have prioritised tax cuts and bankers' bonuses rather than help for those who need it the most. So yes, I very much agree that only through independence will we have the freedom to make the fiscal decisions required to ensure that Scotland prospers and those that need financial support the most get it and are not forgotten. And, presiding officer, that website is www.gov.scot backslash cost of living support. And I would urge everybody to, to have a look at that. Question number seven, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is ensuring the availability of affordable housing, including for students at Scottish universities. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland uh, has led the way in the delivery of affordable housing across the UK, with uh, almost 113,000 affordable homes having been delivered since 2007, over 79,000 of which were for social rent, including uh, nearly 20,000 council homes. The Scottish Government's per capita spending on affordable housing is more than three times higher than the UK Government's. We are also committed to delivering a student accommodation strategy for Scotland, informed in part by a review of the purpose-built student accommodation. The review will look at a number of issues, including affordability and supply. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for that response. In my own region, students at St Andrews University are being housed in Dundee due to a look of affordable local housing. We have heard students being advised to defer courses as they cannot find somewhere else to live. And while the government is not directly involved in student housing and has to work with the universities, the majority of students are in social or private housing. And while the rent freeze is welcome, there is still a housing crisis in Scotland, with more families now homeless and housing completions still below pre-COVID levels. So can I ask the Minister when the housing bill will be introduced to Scotland? Is the intention still next year? And how will it ensure increased provision of quality affordable housing? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, the, t the time frame uh, for the housing bill uh, is, uh, is the same. Um, the pre-COVID levels that the member referred to, of course, has been important because there has been a lag of recovery given the pause uh, in construction and then the, uh, trying to get the things back on track has been challenging. As the member herself said, uh, the, the, you know, recognise that the Scottish Government has no direct role in the placement of students in accommodation. However, we are working with impacted institutions to better understand the issues and to help seek urgent resolutions. Further meetings are scheduled to take place over the, the coming weeks. And in the discussions with institutions, they have cited a number uh, of challenges. Um, institutions have uh, sought to provide uh, reassurance on the steps that they have taken to expand the availability of accommodation to students. Um, our affordable housing supply programme, of course, continues uh, to expand with uh, projects coming in um, from all parts of Scotland. Of course, we want to encourage that, but we will work with institutions in the shorter term to see if there is anything more that can be done. Supplementary, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline how the emergency cost of living legislation progressing through Parliament this week will support students in college or university halls of residence or other types of purpose-built accommodation? Cabinet Secretary. This uh, Parliament, the emergency legislation will ensure that student tenants in the mainstream private rented sector and in student accommodation, both university and college halls of residence and purpose-built student accommodation will not see their rent rise and will ensure that they can remain in their homes. The legislation will be in place until 31 March next year. We recognise tenancies in halls of residence and purpose-built student accommodation are structured differently from other types of tenancies. However, we are committed to parity of protection. A supplementary, Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, international evidence demonstrates that for many universities in different countries, Ireland being one of the key ones, that the introduction of rent controls has resulted in students being further away from being able to access private rented accommodation. Now, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary has the Government done any work to actually look at what impact this will have in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the impact uh, that we'll have in Scotland is to ensure that rents are affordable and that people are not evicted through the winter period and they remain 
in their homes. It just astonishes me that, yet again, the Tories are always on the wrong side of the argument, never on the side of people most impacted by the cost of living crisis. And I think that perhaps that's why they are where they are in terms of public support. So we'll continue to support universities, many of which have had these issues for quite some time, well before any uh, discussion was had around this emergency legislation. We will continue to work with those institutions uh, to help them to resolve some of those issues and uh, get on with the, the work that we are doing to make sure that we continue to expand the affordable housing supply programme. And I can squeeze in question number eight, if I get succinct questions and answers. Question number eight, Frank Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its housing strategy will support action to deliver the target of one million homes to be retrofitted with zero carbon heating systems by 2030. Cabinet Secretary. Now, housing to 2040 and our heat and building strategy work together to deliver our statutory targets for climate change and fuel poverty commitments. Uh, like the aim that all new homes delivered for social rent are zero emissions by 2026, provide a strong foundation for our heat and buildings programme as we continue to retrofit all homes by 2045. We're also committed to introduce a new housing standard by 2025. We will explore how the proposed housing standard and heat and building strategy can be aligned to achieve fair and just implementation. Brian Whittle. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Eco Force scheme is a UK government scheme a value of £1 billion, which, government, which councils can apply for and design to improve the energy efficiency of low income and vulnerable households. So, what is the Scottish Government doing to encourage all Scottish councils to take full advantage of the scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I will certainly get the, the Minister to, to write to the member about that specific point about the scheme. But what I would say to him is that for Scotland alone, of course, we are allocating at least £1.8 billion just in Scotland over the course of this Parliament to accelerate deployment of heat and energy efficiency measures and to support those least able to pay. Um, and of course, we have set up the Green Heat Finance Task Force to recommend ways to increase individual and private sector investment. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions, and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.